Hello and welcome. Um, today our goals are to finish up this unit on chronic adaptations to aerobic exercise. So we've been talking about some of the cardiovascular changes that we experience with regular chronic aerobic exercise. And so one of the factors that we want to kind of hit on here is blood flow and how blood flow changes. So, so one of the differences that we will start to see with those individuals who are regularly doing aerobic exercise is an increase in capillary density. And we can actually see an increase of up to 50% of the capillary density. So essentially what we're talking about here is we're going to build more capillary capillaries. So we're going to have more roads basically uh, leading to the muscles that we are regularly activating. And again, this will be very specific to those muscles that you regularly utilize and um, we won't necessarily see any changes to the muscles that you aren't regularly utilizing. Additionally, we'll see a greater recruitment of existing capillaries. So again, um, you know, we're better able to utilize what we have. And again, through the combination of improved recruitment and increased capillary uh, density, this will allow us to have a greater uh, increase in cross-sectional area for exchange. And so basically, why is that important? When we think about, you know, oxygen delivery, um, we're very good at moving oxygen from the lungs into the blood, but we're not so good at extracting that oxygen from the blood and delivering it to the tissue. So if we can have the roads basically get closer to those cells, that will allow us to drop off more oxygen. So again, imagine this as like, you know, the oxygen, think of this as like school buses and kids on the school bus. If the kids can get off the bus and run right into their house, we can do that really fast. And so that would be to our advantage. However, if we drop off kids and they have to walk half a mile to get into their house, that's going to take significantly longer, um, which can slow us down when we think about, you know, quickly delivering oxygen. So an improvement of the distance that that oxygen must travel, if we can shorten that distance, um, we're going to be more effective. Okay. Um, we'll also have more effective blood flow redistribution from inactive areas. So again, we will shunt or vasoconstrict the vessels that are leading to inactive areas um, and send that blood to areas of high need. Um, again, we will also have this total increase in blood volume. And we said that that was a combination of both increasing plasma volume and increasing red blood cell count. Okay, so again, both of those factors will contribute um, that way to an increase in total blood volume. The more blood I have, the more oxygen I can carry. Um, and also, you know, I have um, more uh, fluid available for sweating and thermoregulatory issues as well. So when we think about chronic adaptations as it relates to blood pressure, um, we don't necessarily see a significant change in resting blood pressure in our healthy subjects, um, but some, sub some studies have shown that there will be a modest reduction after training for borderline to moderately hypertensive individuals. Now we certainly know that for our hypertensive people or people with high blood pressure, we can get them back to their, um, you know, close to normal values. And for people that are borderline or moderately hypertensive, we can reduce blood pressure by six to seven millimeters of mercury. Um, again, we're not exactly sure why that is, what's causing those changes. Um, but again, you know, for the average person, we won't see much of a difference, but, but for someone who has hypertension, um, we could see a su substantial improvement in this area. So the next factor we're going to take a look at is blood volume. And again, we've already kind of talked about this previously in this lecture, but essentially when we uh, regularly do um, endurance training, we will see an increase in blood volume primarily due to that increase in plasma volume. And so how does this work? Okay, so let me see if I can draw a little picture for you. So if this is the blood vessel, okay, and you have all this stuff inside of the blood vessel, like red blood cells and stuff. Um, one thing that's going to change is we're going to increase albumin levels. And albumin is like a little protein that floats around inside the blood. And as we increase these little proteins inside the blood, we also increase something called oncotic pressure. And oncotic pressure is um, pressure that is going to pull fluids in. So those little protein molecules are going to um, 
attract fluid and that fluid will be pulled in via that oncotic pressure. Okay, so as I increase the amount of albumin that I have, there's an increase in oncotic pressure inside of the vessel and for those reasons fluid is going to come in. Okay, um, we'll see substantial increases in plasma volume in as little as two weeks. However, we do start to see these changes almost immediately. So within the first couple exercise sessions, um, we will see uh, some changes beginning to occur. The other uh, component that is important for us to think about when we think about an increase in blood volume is an increase in red blood cell count. Okay, um, So we'll see an increase in the total number of red blood cells, however the hematocrit actually decreases. So how does that work, you're wondering. Okay, So basically what we're saying is we're going to increase the number of red blood cells but the hematocrit is like the percentage of blood that's made up of red blood cells. And because blood is made of the plasma and the red blood cells, I'm increasing both components. However, I will increase the plasma volume levels significantly more than I will increase the red blood cell count. So for example, if I started with 50 I wish I had a touch screen. 50 plasma volume molecules. And 50 red blood cells. My hematocrit count might be 50% or 50. Okay. So now with training, I'm going to increase both components. So let's say I increase my plasma volume to 70. and I increase my red blood cell count to 55. Again, these are just arbitrary numbers. I just want to kind of illustrate to you what we mean by hematocrit and how that decreases. Okay, so now I'm going to use my calculator because I'm not good at math. Okay, so now we have 125 total molecules versus 100 molecules when we started. Okay, so the hematocrit is 55 divided by 125. So the hematocrit now is 44% in this example versus in the beginning we had 50% hematocrit. However, the absolute amount of red blood cells has increased. Okay, again, you don't need to memorize those numbers or anything. I just want to kind of illustrate to you that um, we do see this increase in the number of red blood cells. So what about respiratory adaptation? So we will see some changes within the pulmonary system. However, um, keep in mind that these changes are, are fairly minimal in the grand scheme of things. Really, we're after those cardiovascular adaptations. Okay. Um, so pulmonary ventilation, no change at rest. And again, when we think about our, our physiological functioning at rest for healthy individuals, that's, this is no problem because we're getting plenty of air in. Okay. Um, we'll actually see a decrease in pulmonary ventilation during submaximal exercise. And again, um, that's because that exercise bout is easier, right? So again, um, we become more efficient. So um, I think we used an example previously in this lecture where we looked at, you know, somebody who's untrained could run a 10 minute mile. And then when they became more trained, that 10 minute mile felt easier. Okay, so as that 10 minute mile feels easier, we're also decreasing um, the amount of air that we're bringing in at that level. Okay, um, maximal pulmonary ventilation will increase. And again, the absolute level at which we reach that um, threshold will also increase. Okay, so again, maybe an untrained person was reaching their um, kind of maximal exercise capacity when they were running like seven miles per hour. And as this person becomes more trained, they're able to reach this level at like nine miles per hour. Okay, so again, um, the absolute intensity goes up and therefore our, our pulmonary ventilation will also go up. Okay. Pulmonary diffusion. Okay, so pulmonary diffusion, we're looking at the ability of the oxygen molecules to move from um, the alveoli into the blood. Okay. Um, so this is unaltered at rest in during submaximal exercise. However, it will increase in maximal exercise um, due to increases in lung perfusion. So um, really what's going on during maximal exercise, we've increased the capillary density of the um, pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary um, capillaries. So we're able to move that um, oxygen from the lungs into the blood. So that's good news. 
okay? Um, and again, the other factor that's important is we're sending more blood to those capillaries that we already have within the pulmonary system because we've increased the total blood volume that we have. Okay, so again, when we think about these pulmonary adaptations, interestingly, it's really the cardiovascular side of things that's being modified in order for us to improve functioning here. AVO2 difference, um, the oxygen content of the blood is unaffected by training. So again, we're thinking about that relationship between um, oxygen, how much oxygen can move from the lungs into the um, arteries. And again, we're pretty good at that to start with. We're like at 98% to start with. So um, the amount of oxygen that we're able to get into the blood is not changed um, during training or with training, I should say. Um, however, AVO2 difference during exercise um, improves because we have an increase in capillary density to the active muscles, okay, which would allow us to deliver more oxygen. Okay, So we're not necessarily changing the artery value of the AVO2 difference, but we are changing the venous value because we're able to drop off more oxygen um, at the level of the tissue. What about muscular adaptations? So um, a couple things we want to mention here. So you'll want to take some notes on this section because this, I think, is the only slide I have on the muscular adaptation. So muscle fiber type, um, we can't necessarily change the muscle fiber type that we have. Okay, so we have these type 1 fibers and we have type 2 fibers. Type 1 fibers are the fast twitch fibers. Type 2, I'm sorry, type 1 fibers are um, the slow twitch fibers and type two are our fast switch fibers. Okay, so type one would be really important for um, endurance training because they are better at aerobic metabolism and that sort of thing. And again, we'll kind of compare and contrast these when we get to our anaerobic section. You should have covered these a little bit in anatomy and physiology as well. So um, muscle fibers, so we're gonna do something called selective recruitment and selective hypertrophy. Okay. Um, so selective recruitment, we're able to more effectively select those slow twitch fibers so that we can activate and utilize them. And we're also going to experience hypertrophy of those select fibers. Okay, so again, if you have a combination of both type 1 and type 2 fibers, we're able to um, select those type 1 fibers and increase their size and have no effect on the slow on the type 2 fibers. Okay. So again, um, we will be able to see an increase in activation and also size or hypertrophy of the fat of, gosh, why do I keep doing that, of the slow twitch fibers or the type 1 fibers and our fast twitch fibers will be unaffected or unmodified um, with aerobic training. Okay. Capillary supply will increase the number of capillaries to the active muscle. And again, um, this will be very specific to the muscle that you regularly activate. Okay, So again, if you are a swimmer, for example, um, maybe we'll see an increase in capillary density to like the back muscles because those are really important for swimming. But maybe you're not a big kicker when you swim, so we'll see less change um, to your leg muscles, for example. Okay, So again, it's very specific. Um, myoglobin content. So myoglobin is... Let me draw you a little cell. I'm getting into these drawings here. Sorry, I'm trying to be kind of quiet. I am recording this in the hotel and it's like 5 a.m., um, which is fine. That's like my normal, that's my jam. Um, but I'm trying to not be too loud. So anyway, so here's the cell and here's like the blood vessel, okay? And the oxygen is going to move from the blood vessel into the cell and then the myoglobin his job is to carry that oxygen from the edge of the cell to the mitochondria, okay? Um, so he's like a little transporter that's going to get the oxygen around the cell to whatever mitochondria need it within the cell, okay? So as you might expect, we'll increase the myoglobin content within um, the cells that we utilize when we become more highly trained. This is crazy. So myoglobin content can increase by as much as 70 to 80 percent. So we are able to really increase the number of little transporters that we have here that's going to allow us to quickly move that oxygen from the edge of the cell to the mitochondria so that I can use them. Okay, mitochondria. Again, we know that this is the location of aerobic metabolism. 
So not surprising, we'll see some modifications here with regular training, and we're going to see an increase in the number and size of the mitochondria that we have. Again, this will be pretty darn specific to the muscle that we utilize. Okay, so for example, if you were a cyclist, um, we would see this kind of this increase in mitochondrial uh, size and number um, within the leg muscles, for example. Okay. Oxidative enzymes, again, oxidative enzymes are needed in order to have those aerobic processes occur. The enzymes are going to um, assist that process in occurring quickly. Okay, so I'm going to increase the number of oxidative enzymes that I have, um, and that'll allow me to in enhance oxidative metabolism. What about metabolic adaptation? So um, one factor that will change will be our lactate threshold, okay? Again, we talked about this in our metabolism unit, but essentially, if this is speed down here, sorry, it takes me a while to use my little mouse. Okay, mile per hour and lactate okay kind of looks like that so again um, lactate threshold we're looking at what what's that intensity point at which the lactate levels will start to accumulate and again that tells us this interaction between um, aerobic and anaerobic metabolism okay with training i push that lactate threshold to the right okay so again i'm able to do more work before I reach that kind of that point um, where we switch over to anaerobic metabolism. Okay, so again, maybe I was running at six miles per hour when I reached it as an untrained person. When I became trained, which is shown here in blue, um, I'm able to run eight miles per hour before I start to rely on the anaerobic contribution. Okay. Um, also, again, we see a higher tolerance of lactate. So our higher um, we have a higher absolute amount of lactate that we can tolerate before our body kind of says that's enough. Okay, so again, we have a higher um, tolerance, pain tolerance, essentially, as we become more trained. Respiratory exchange ratio, or RER, um, we'll see a decrease in this during submaximal exercise. Again, as RER decreases, that tells us that we're able to rely more on fats as a fuel. Again, that would be an advantage to us. We would prefer to rely on fats as a fuel source um, simply because we have more of them. Um, so we would like to save those carbohydrates for a higher intensity situation. So a trained person would be better at utilizing fats as a fuel source in comparison to untrained. Okay? Oxygen consumption um, will remain the same at rest and remain unaltered um, or maybe even decreased during submaximal exercise. Again, that's because we come, become more efficient. So going back to our, our one example, keep in mind when we say submaximal exercise, we're, we're talking about that absolute level. So um, somebody who's untrained and was running a 10 minute mile as a moderate pace before they became trained, um, running that same 10 minute mile after they're trained will be easier, okay, because they're more efficient. So therefore they might see a decrease in oxygen uh, consumption in that particular scenario. And certainly we can understand that VO2 max or the maximum amount of oxygen that we can consume during maximal exercise will increase substantially um, with training. And again, that's one of the um, really the end goals with regular aerobic training is to see that increase in VO2 max. Oh, this is much nicer than what I drew for you. Um, so here you can see the um, untrained person and lactate threshold, they're doing like 250 um, watts of work before they start to rely on the anaerobic um, pathway. And then with regular training, maybe they've increased that work rate to about 300, 325 watts um, before they're relying on that um, anaerobic pathway. Okay. So, you know, although these improvements in VO2 max is really what we're after, well, they will eventually plateau. There's a point at which we won't be able to increase our VO2 max any higher, okay? Um, endurance performance can continue to improve um, for years with continued training, even if our VO2 max stays the same, okay? 
Okay, so, so what's going on with this? So we think about genetic makeup, right? So genetics predetermine the range for which a person's VO2 max um, accounts for. And again, this, can, this could um, contribute between 25 to 50% of the variance in VO2 max levels. So what are we saying here? I'm saying that who your parents are will determine in part about 25 to 50% of um, your ability to improve in this particular area. Okay, So this will explain individual variations in response to identical training programs. So for example, if I was a, I'm going to go with um, cross country because that's an easy example. So if I'm a cross country coach and I have all these people that are doing the exact same workouts and I have two guys that come in and they can both run let's say um, 16 minutes in the 5K. Okay, so they're the same um, as it relates to the kind of their starting point. Now, as they um, train with me and within one season, maybe one of the guys improves from 16 minutes and now he's able to run 15.45. Wow, he made a great improvement, that's good, okay? But the other guy, again, doing the same exact training and everything else, maybe he's able to run like 15.15 at the end of the season, right? So again, they both improve, so don't get me wrong, no matter who you are, no matter what your genetic makeup is, you will see positive adaptations with regular training. So please make sure you note that, that it's not like your genetics aren't um, handicapping you in terms of um, being able to improve because we're able to improve these components regardless of who you are. Okay. However, people with certain genetic makeups will be able to improve to a greater extent than others. Okay. So that creates this kind of this um, this concept of high responders versus low responders, and this is really really interesting to me. Um, the, the the tricky part with this is the previous example I gave you. I have these two male runners that come in kind of the same, um, and one improves a little bit, and one improves a lot. Okay. Um, so maybe we can apply this principle of high responders and low responders. So um, this is a genetic phenomenon, not necessarily a result of compliance or non-compliance. However, in some cases, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, the person that improved 45 seconds like obviously worked harder. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, they could both be working equivalently hard, right? And one only sees that 15 second improvement and the other saw the 45 second improvement. So check this out. 10 pairs of identical twins completed 20 weeks of endurance programming. So again, when we talk about identical twins, keep in mind that they have the same genetic background, right? So they have the same exact genetic makeup. Across twin pairs, improvement of VO2 max varied from zero to 40, okay? This I also saw, thought was super interesting. Families, including a biological mother, father, and three or more ch children, Chain, trained three days per week for 20 weeks, and the average increase in VO2 max was 17%. However, this varied from zero to 50%, right? So heredity, they believed, was responsible for predicting 47% of the variability in VO2 max in this particular study, right? So the, I guess the other tricky thing when we think about performance, we think about you know testing VO2 max. Now you've done this test, you've done this treadmill test, a lot of you, okay? Um, so when we think about this as it relates to a, a training program, right? Um, there's a lot of other factors that go into this, right? So are they sleeping well? Maybe they're doing the same workouts, but one person um, isn't getting good rest. Maybe one is um, drinking. Maybe one is eating like garbage, okay? So again, we can think about these kind of these other layers um, that go into our performance. Maybe one from a mental standpoint is very competitive and so like they're willing to really push themselves. And the other one's just like, oh yeah, this is fun, but like, you know, I'm just out here to have a good time or whatever. They're not competitive, right? Um, so again, we look at all these other traits that need to be kind of piled onto each other. And again, think about your family. Think about your brothers or sisters. Um, so my older, well, all three of my all three of the people in my family um, were involved in sports and like my dad played basketball. So like we grew up playing basketball. That was like my thing. And same with both of my brothers. Um, however, it's really interesting to look at the different personalities in kind of your your um, 
how that in your different experiences that you have, because again, we're all three different ages, um, how different experiences have shaped your kind of outlook of sport, of exercise and that sort of thing, right? So um, my older brother, for example, again, same upbringing, same parents, same really major experiences um, and certainly the same genetics, right? So my older brother um, does compete in like, um, marathons and triathlons and stuff like that but he's like just kind of like out there to have fun and he like likes talking to people he likes the social side of it but not super competitive like he just does it to have fun um, and it's just interesting because you can imagine that I'm completely the opposite of that like I'm there to freaking do the best that I can and beat every single person that I can possibly beat. Like that's um, kind of my like outlook on, on endurance sport, right? Whereas my um, little brother, who's probably from a talent perspective, the, the most talented of the three of us doesn't do anything at all, right? So again, he like never had to try in high school. Like he was always a good athlete and um, never really put any work into it. Um, so it's just really interesting to see, okay, how does the, how did those layers kind of play into this and how does that influence um, our ability to improve VO2 max? So we think about um, all this science, like, yeah, this is freaking cool, but we have to, at the end of the day, think about someone's motivation, right? So that's maybe even more important than any other component, right? When we think about how much can someone improve? Well, how motivated are they to improve, right? How dedicated are they? How consistent are they with their training? Um, how consistent are they with eating healthy and sleeping good and um, taking care of themselves from a mental perspective and keeping themselves healthy so they're not getting an injury? So again, there's these other things going on um, so I think when we think about this high responder versus low responder, a lot of people will say like, well, I'm just not a runner. I'm just not an endurance athlete or whatever. You can be if you want to be, right? So I think my major takeaway that I want you to get from this slide is yes, genetics play an important role in determining how much I can respond or how much I can improve. But at the end of the day, all of us can improve. That's the beauty of um, how the body works is we're all able to make these kind of these positive changes. Um, so I think that that's super powerful and I want you to really take that um, from this slide. I know I went off on a tangent, sorry. So what are some factors that affect our training responses? So first and foremost, we should look at initial fitness level or initial aerobic fitness level. Okay. So people that have low fitness to start um, have a greater capacity to improve, right? That makes sense. So if you can only run um, 11 minute miles to start with, you have a greater capacity to potentially improve. Okay. Whereas somebody who is an elite athlete who can already run, let's say like a five minute mile, okay, if you're already at that level, you can't improve as much because you're already closer to your ceiling. Same thing's true in the weight room, right? If you get a beginner in there who's never lifted before, their capacity to improve in strength is very, very large because they can't really lift a lot to start because they don't have any strength. However, somebody that's closer to that ceiling, somebody that's a chronic regular strength trainer, they're already close to that top. So seeing just a small change in their squat max or a small change in their bench press max is a big deal um, because they're already close to that ceiling. Okay. Um, so here's some things to jot down. So cardiovascular patients with poor fitness can improve VO2 max by 50%. Okay. So again, we can see a huge increase in VO2 max for those people because they're so low to start with. Okay. Healthy adults can improve by 10 to 15% with VO2 max in regards to um, regular training. And our elite athletes can look for just a one to 2% increase. Okay, so kind of interesting to think about those elite athletes are doing all these things just to get 1%, just to get 1% improvement. And again, that's, that's what you have to do when you're kind of already at your peak, when you're kind of already at that um, close to the top, okay? Training intensity can be measured in many ways. So aerobic fitness can improve between 60 to 70% intensity. So again, kind of that moderate intensity zone. Um, the higher the intensity, the greater the improvement, particularly when the volume is controlled. So for example, um, if you could do, oops. Sorry, Breck was calling me. Um, so I think we were on intensity. Okay, so um, we can measure this in many ways. Aerobic fitness can improve by 60 to 70%. I'm sorry, 
between the intensities of 60 to 70 percent. Okay, um, the higher the intensity, the greater the improvement, particularly when the volume is controlled. So again, if I had a group of people that were, um, you know, running. Uh, 150 minutes per week, if we keep that volume the same of 150 minutes per week, but have them run faster, um, we will see, see a substantial improvement in uh, VO2 max. Um, there is a ceiling at which we no longer receive gains, right? So there is some point of limiting return as it relates to intensity. Um, if we do too much, that will put us at risk for um, various overtraining injuries. Um, where does this kind of ceiling occur? Um, probably somewhere around 90% intensity. So once we're above kind of that 90% intensity range, um, we're not necessarily seeing more aerobic improvements. However, there are certainly benefits to exercising above 90% um, that are outside of these aerobic improvements, right? So again, we can certainly see neuromuscular change um, as it relates to activating the appropriate motor neurons. And um, we think about, you know, specificity of training. So again, if I want to compete at a level above 90%, um, I need to consistently work at that level in order for me to be comfortable competing at that level. Okay. Um, okay. So however, excessive training increases our risk of injury. 60% Intensity is considered kind of the lower range, but if you're very out of shape, you can start with something even lower than that. Um, the general guideline is preferably 30 minutes per day, 70% intensity, or 45 minutes at 60% intensity could do the same thing. Okay, so you can kind of pick and choose. Do you want to do 30 minutes at more of like a moderately high intensity, or do you want to do 45 minutes at a lower intensity, like a um, like a nice walk versus um, a jog or you know uh, an, an elliptical exercise um, for a shorter duration? So again, we can kind of play with those variables to um, meet the needs and the desires of the individual. Okay. Um, okay, frequency, how frequently do you need to change to train? Um, it really depends on the person, right? So again, in order for us to um, see an overload, okay, we need to do more than what we're currently doing. So if you're currently doing three days a week, if you want to improve, you need to do four, okay? So again, we'll talk more when we get to our, our training unit where we talk about program design and that sort of thing, um, training specificity and overloading the body, right? So again, if I'm doing five days and I want to improve, maybe I need to go to six. If I'm doing six sessions a week, maybe I need to add a two a day and do seven, okay? Um, so again, um, frequency can be improved depending on the individual. For general health, we want to shoot for about five days a week or most days is what they say, but five days a week would be a great starting point for people um, to start to see some of those health-related benefits. Duration, um, again, really depends on who it is, right? So we've got to think about their initial fitness level. Um, general recommendations are 30 minutes per day to meet the minimum ACSM guidelines for health. So 30 minutes moderate intensity exercise five days a week. Um, however, you know, if, if a lot of us only did 30 minutes a day, we would lose fitness. Okay, so we have to think about that principle of progressive overload. So if you're doing six hours of, of work a week in order to continue to improve our fitness, um, ideally we need to do 620 or we need to do 630 or whatever in order to continue to see those gains. Okay. Um, for untrained people, this is insane. Three to five minutes of exercise can produce improvements. Okay, so again, just getting started and doing just a little bit is enough for somebody who's untrained in order to kind of see some of those positive adaptations. Um, again, we think about training frequency. Um, it's theorized that an increase in training frequency could elicit additional cardiovascular benefits. So if I'm interested in um, improving my cardiovascular fitness um, and I'm already doing five days a week, again, you can add more. Maybe you can do um, add a 20 minute um, workout in the mornings or whatever. So an increase in frequency should elicit additional cardiovascular benefits. Um, however, some researchers have reported that intensity is more important than the frequency. So um, it maybe it would be better to do more um, moderate to high intensity workouts um, at that same frequency as opposed to adding like a 20 minute something in the morning. Okay. 
um, an increase in training frequency may not elicit greater cardiovascular adaptations. However, it, as we think about overall health, well-being, uh, body composition, um, maybe some of those other psychological benefits as well. You know, we think about decreasing anxiety, depression, um, improved confidence, all of those factors. Um, we can certainly see improvements from those aspects um, kind of outside of that cardiovascular realm. What's the appropriate exercise mode? Um, whatever you want to do to activate large amount of muscle mass and the kicker is you have to enjoy it you know um i spent many many years personal training and you know a lot of times people would say like oh you know like i really want to run like you're a runner and um you know i know that's what i need to do in order to lose weight or whatever but i just don't like running i'm like no dude you don't have to run if you don't like running don't run do something else figure out what it is that you like and let's do that when well, maybe it's the elliptical maybe it's the bike maybe it's the pool maybe it's the row machine maybe you want to do some different circuit types of training right um so again i think that you know if you're working in this industry if you're working in the fitness industry the best thing we can do is expose people to a variety of types okay and let them decide oh maybe you like that spinning class maybe you like the the kickboxing okay um so again there's all these different things that we can do um our job is to expose these clients to all these different things and then they can kind of self-select what do they enjoy what was what was the most fun right so again you don't have to run in order to be fit from an aerobic standpoint um, and i think that that's kind of like a um a hard misconception of the general population like i got to do something really hard in order to um, get any benefits but like walking is good for a lot of people you know so um, we've got to figure out what it is for that person um, so that they can stick with it so how long before improvements begin to occur okay um, so aerobic Fitness can start to improve within several weeks, as short as 10 days. Uh, in as short as, as 10 days of aerobic training, VO2 max can increase by 10%. That's a 1% increase every day. Um, that is insane to me. And again, those people um, probably aren't super fit to start with. So this is my example study. So this study looked at 10 young adults, trained 10 days of 60 minutes cycling. And this is what the cycling bout included each of those 10 days. So they did 10 minutes at 65% intensity. So that would be kind of like a warm up. 20 minutes at 75% intensity. So that would be like moderate intensity. And then five by three minutes at 95% with two minute recovery. Okay. Um, again, that's a high intensity workout. That's a hard, that would, that's a hard workout. That would be really difficult. I think for me to do 10 days in a row, because that's pretty darn challenging okay um so again that's what they did for this for this study that we're talking about here okay and what did they see at the end of 10 days they saw a 12 percent increase in cardiac output a 15 percent increase in um, stroke volume and plasma volume increased by nine percent okay so again those are some really um substantial improvements but again you were asking people to do kind of high intensity 60 minutes for 10 days in a row probably not realistic for um, the general population but again kind of an interesting study to kind of apply those things so um, anyway i think that's it for today i hope you guys have a great day and um, let me know if you do have any questions